This happened a few weeks ago. I'm 24, a female, and probably couldn't defend myself against a 10-year-old. I went to the grocery store to pick up some things the other night. When I got to the register, there was a man helping me bag my groceries while the cashier was checking me out. I was buying some dog treats, and he asked what kind of dog I had. I said a golden doodle. I have a golden doodle, and my boyfriend has a German shepherd. And he said, oh my god, me too. I didn't really get an off vibe from him, but he would stare and not break eye contact at all. I chalked it up to him missing social cues and trying to be friendly. After I paid, he started pushing the cart for me out the door. This isn't uncommon. They typically help you take your things to your car. I have social anxiety and feel very awkward and guilty having them do that for me, so I always say, I'm good, but thank you so much. And every other time, they've said, all right, have a good one. When I said I'm good to this guy, he said, no, I got it. Very bluntly and stared at me the whole time. I started to get a bad vibe. And it was about eight at night and barely anyone was there. He said, well, my shift is over, so I'm walking to my car anyway. Weird, because he didn't clock out. But maybe he had before he did the last checkout. He was very talkative in the store, asking a ton of questions about my dog and telling me about his, but when we got outside he barely said much. I started asking questions about his dog because I felt anxious with the silence, but I really regret that. He took it as an interest. He immediately said, well if you give me your number you can meet him, and just stared yet again. I responded, oh I'm sorry I don't give my number to strangers. I didn't want to say no because I have a boyfriend because he seemed like he might get angry over that. I don't know, just the feeling in the moment. We had loaded all the groceries into my trunk and I was just thinking, thank God I can get out of here, but no. The cart was between me and him and he was positioned on the driver's side so in order to get to my door I would have to go past him. I said, well, I gotta get home, my dog is waiting for his treats. He just stared. I realized I was going to have to go past him if I wanted to leave, so I looked around to see if anyone else was in the parking lot in case something more happened. No one. I started to get extremely anxious. He could push the cart into me or just grab me himself. I have had a traumatic experience before, and my problem is I don't have fight or flight, I just freeze. And just like that, he walked away pushing the cart to where they returned in the parking lot. I took the chance to get in my car and I locked the doors immediately. I wish I left then, but I needed a moment to breathe. I saw on my side mirror him getting into his car. I quickly put the car in drive and drove out. The exit is a stoplight and just my luck, it's red and I'm turning left. I see his car right behind me not 30 seconds later. I panicked, but then thought he said he's going home, it's nothing. I only lived two minutes from the grocery store. I made the turn and he was hanging back. I didn't put my blinker on for the next turn. He made it too. The next turn was a stoplight and then the turn for my road. As I get to the light, it's red again. I thought maybe I should drive to a police station just in case, but as soon as that thought came, the light went green. My boyfriend and I only moved here two months ago, so I couldn't think in my head how to get to the station and... I am terrible at using my phone while driving. I'm not even 30 seconds from the last turn onto our street. Our street is a dead end with only four houses on it. It's very long and we're at the end. No one goes down it unless they live there or are lost. I turn and he makes the turn too. Oh god, I think. I literally just directed him to my house. Thankfully I have Bluetooth so I call my boyfriend. I said... Hey, a guy from the grocery store is following me. Turn all the lights on, open the gate, and let Nike out. Nike is his German shepherd, and he was trained to be a German police dog and then got extra bite training. He can hold someone for up to six hours, so now knowing he was outside, I didn't feel nervous. I was nervous that my boyfriend wouldn't have gotten the gate open in time, and I would have to either sit in my car or get out fast and put the coat in. As I pulled up, I saw the gate was open, thank God. My boyfriend was on the front porch with Nike on leash and his gun in the air. 
I fly through and down the driveway. This guy actually follows. Does he not see the gun and guard dog? Well, he did at that moment, because my boyfriend let Nike go and he charges the guy's car, jumped up at the driver window, frothing at the mouth, showing all teeth and hair on his back standing up. He looked terrifying even to me, and he was protecting me. I gave Nike his command to come back, hoping this guy got the hint that if he gets out of his car, he's going to die. And he did. He reversed that car so fast out of the driveway he nearly hit the gate. I collapsed on the front porch and hugged my boyfriend. Nike got a steak for dinner. I reported the man to the grocery store because I remembered his name on his name tag purposefully. They later contacted me that he had been served termination papers. So I, a 20-year-old female, lived in a shady apartment complex in an otherwise rich suburban area for three years, and have lots of stories that could fit on here, but this one is about a neighbor I'll call Bob. Now a little backstory. Me, 18 at the time, and my then 16-year-old sister used to babysit all the neighborhood kids. These kids considered us their friends, and it got to where they seemed to have a radar of when me and my sister went outside. They'd come out and talk to us, and we'd let them ride our skateboards and such in the parking lot, and these kids were ages 8 to 13. So one day we were outside with them, and we were joined by a stranger. He stood between us and our car, towering over us. He introduced himself and asked us to sign a petition he had made up. We did, just being friendly, then he asked us how old we were. I thought maybe he was a fellow teenager that looked older, or that he was just awkward, so I told him I was 18, and the very next question was if I wanted to go out with him. In front of my mom and the other kid's mom, I awkwardly declined and he continued talking about how he thought me and my sister were in middle school. Also, he was 28. Eventually, he wandered away to ask someone else to sign his petition. A few days later, he knocked at our door. After asking the neighbors for the address, he had a bag of what he said was chicken and wanted us to go eat it with him at the park. We declined because we both had schoolwork to do. We walked away and he was mumbling about how antisocial everyone was. Later, we look out our window and see him playing baseball with two girls. He kept physically moving their arms to different positions even though they shrugged away from him. Next day, one of the kids runs up to me. I'll call her Maddie. She's eight. She got a new pair of Heelys and wanted help with them. I was holding her hand and guiding her along when Bob appears and says he can help better. Maddie says no, but he insists. He pushed me aside and reaches for Maddie, holding her tightly around the upper chest area. Her grandma was there too and flips out, and he just wanders away. The next day, Maddie is freaking out, saying Bob was just sitting on her porch when she left for school that morning. Her parents found out, and as they walked outside, he let himself in, and they said he went to their kitchen to make orange chicken. We later found out another neighbor had a similar story. Another time, we were helping a family move. They have a two-year-old son. The garages are in a triangle shape to the road, almost a roundabout. There's a flat patch of grass behind them. Well, here comes Bob to help us. He criticized the way we pack things and didn't help until our neighbor politely asked him to leave. Well, he left the garage, but instead of leaving, he asked the two-year-old if he wanted to play. The kid said no, and it made him mad. He picked up the kid to play, and the kid slapped him. He asked the kid if he wanted to go behind the garage to play ball. The kid's mom doesn't notice, so I go with them and guide the kid to his mom. The climax of the story is when me and my sister went on a walk with our 17-year-old friend and her other friend. Maddie found us and wanted to come along. So we are starting out when Bob comes out. He sees our friend and asks how old she is and how much she weighs because she's so skinny. He asks where we're going. My friend tells him we're going for ice cream on a girl's trip. We didn't ask her to say that. He's like, ah oh, man, and stomps away. We continue our walk, but halfway through we have a weird feeling. I look behind us and Bob is running towards us. 
He yells at us for hiding from him while also telling Maddie how pretty she is. An older neighbor sees us and asks him what's going on. He tells the man we're being mean and he needs to go write a song about us. He leaves, but we see him sitting at the park. Well, he saw us and again comes running. We stop and he asks which one of us is over 18. Maddie's dad is here at this point and tells him we aren't interested in him. He explodes, telling the dad to go screw himself and that he's so rude, calling me all sorts of terrible names in the process. Maddie's crying and the neighbor who saw us before came to check on us since he saw Bob running. Bob goes inside muttering to himself. For weeks we don't see him. A single dad and his five-year-old move in and we are introducing ourselves to them. My mom kind of tips him off that there's someone in their building who is a little off, especially around Maddie. The dad says he's seen someone like that giving kids candy at the pool when the kids looked uncomfortable. Well, here comes Bob, as if on cue. He immediately tells the girl in front of her dad that she looks like a movie star and that she's so pretty. He asks to play with her, but the dad says no and they go inside. Turns out they're next door neighbors. We still didn't see him much, but other neighbors were telling us stories about him. There's a woman who's alone most of the day with her two kids under five who told us he watches her when she goes to and from her car. Also, Maddie's parents continue to see him watching her. Then one day, we're again babysitting and here he comes. Only this time, he's swinging nunchucks. Maddie screams and hides in our car. Bob strolls over with his nunchucks and starts talking to us all casual. Then he cranes his head to look into the car and says, Where's Maddie? We told him she wasn't here and he walked away. But then... Most of the kids were afraid to go outside when they saw him. He had a habit of wandering around the complex. We could tell by his height and lanky gait. A few times we'd see Bob with his dad. Those times, neither even glanced at us. Then one day, he just stopped showing up. We'd see his dad and brother come in and out all the time, but never him. We only saw him again a year later, and it was only for one day near Christmas and... Then he disappeared again. So, I don't know what happened to him, but it was just one of our weird experiences with weird neighbors in those three weird years living there. This all started my sophomore year of high school. I was 15 at a new school, so I didn't have many friends yet. I was in that phase where I thought I needed a boyfriend to have validation, so I was actively trying to find a date for the homecoming dance. A classmate suggested a junior in one of her classes, whom I'll call David, to be my date and got him to ask me out. He seemed nice, so I said yes, a decision that would haunt me for the next two years. David and I had fun at homecoming, so when he asked me to be his girlfriend, I said yes. It's important to note that he was quite the loner. He was very much into science and often spent time alone conducting experiments in his room and even at school sometimes. I just brushed it off as him being quirky and figured I shouldn't get in the way of his passions, but it wasn't long before I realized that there was much more to this nice guy facade. Over the first several weeks of our relationship, we would talk over the phone and David would make increasingly inappropriate comments about things he wanted to do to me. I was 15 at the time and he was 17, so not only was I incredibly uncomfortable, but he was also nearly an adult himself, making those comments to a younger girl. I kept telling him I wasn't comfortable with the things he was saying, but he always laughed it off as me being a prude. I was fed up after a while and finally threatened to break up with him and that finally made him stop. I should have recognized the red flags and bailed at that moment, but again, I was dumb and felt I wasn't worth anything unless I had a boyfriend. Although the inappropriate comments stopped for the time being, he would still become increasingly possessive and downright obsessed over what I was doing at all hours of the day. He would intrude on conversations I had with my friends and want to know things that frankly weren't any of his business. One day when I was getting into the shower, he called and my dad told him I would call him when I was done. Instead of simply waiting like any rational person would do, he called a total of four times over the next 10 to 15 minutes to see if I was out of the shower yet. 
I began to feel suffocated, but every time I asked him to back off, he would cry about how depressed he was and that he only wanted to talk to someone to feel like he was wanted. I always fell for it like the dummy I was, but now I recognize the clear manipulation that it was. One day, I finally had enough. I broke up with him in person at school and he bawled like a child. I didn't let it get to me this time, however, and firmly told him I didn't want to be his girlfriend anymore. Although he couldn't get it his way, he still somehow convinced me to stay friends. I know, I was an idiot, but things didn't end there. Oh no, dear readers, we were only just beginning. Over the next several months, David kept trying to get me to go out with him again, even going as far as to cry in front of other people to garner sympathy. He even tried starting rumors about us having been intimate, when we never were. Fortunately for me, David had earned a bad reputation throughout his school career, so no one really believed him. He would even try to trick me into dating by subtly suggesting we go see a movie as friends, which I always got around by inviting my friends to come along too. They knew what he was doing and never turned down the chance to help a girl out. In the last few weeks I spoke to him, he would sit on the phone for hours on hours, literally begging me to take him back, and thankfully I held on strong and kept refusing. One night his brother actually called me telling me he was crying hysterically. Eventually it came to a point where I told him I didn't want to hang out anymore because it was clear that he would not stop until I became his girlfriend again. He agreed to not approach me anymore, but I wouldn't be writing this story if it had ended here. The very next day at school, David came up to me like nothing had happened. I once again reminded him of the conversation we had had the night before about how we agreed to not hang out anymore, but he acted offended that I would even suggest such a thing. Eventually, my friends and I convinced him to leave, but of course it didn't stop there. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school, call my house and my cell phone. This was the days before smartphones, so blocking his number wasn't as easy. I tried to get help from the school staff, but the vice principal basically told me that there was nothing I could do because he wasn't trying to hurt me. I was frustrated, but thankfully David seemed to back off when it was clear that I wasn't going to give in. This is until I got another boyfriend. The following school year, my junior year, I started dating a senior named Justin. Not long after we went public with our relationship, I noticed David following me again. Now Justin was a football player and he was a pretty big guy with unresolved anger issues, so he didn't take kindly to this guy. He would hang out with me and my friends and David would hover around nearby, walking by every now and then and making it blatantly obvious that he was spying on me. One day, Justin walked straight up to David and confronted him. He didn't lay his hands on him or threaten him in any way, but he did ask, What are you doing? in a really angry tone. David simply muttered some kind of excuse and scurried away. We thought that was the end of it, but later in the day I was called to the principal's office. Turns out, David claimed that Justin threatened him and blocked the doorway so he couldn't move. Justin denied it, of course, and told the principal I could back up his claim, which I did. Thankfully, nothing came of it, but this was only the first of a long line of incidents. Over the school year, David and his brother, who was a year younger than me, would try to get Justin in trouble every which way they could, even starting rumors and threatening his life. A classmate of mine overheard them talking about ambushing Justin and hurting him, but even though I brought this to the staff, nothing was done about it. All the while, David kept following me when Justin wasn't around. This was even an incident in the school gym one day when a bunch of classes had to stay there for the period. He and I were both there and he made sure to sit on the bleachers nearby, even following me when I moved. I was on the verge of tears, but then I saw two guys I knew sitting a few rows down from me. They were cool with me, so I got their attention and after explaining what was going on, asked them if I could sit with them to feel safer. They accepted and we ended up having a good time talking about music and anime. In spite of this, things just kept getting worse with David. Finally, it came to a head when David's brother wrote a letter to Justin's sister. They had been good friends before this whole mess started and in the letter, David's brother threatened physical harm to me and to Justin. 
The sister gave me the letter to Justin, who then came to me, and we both brought it to the principal. That was when the principal called everyone involved into his office and had a nice little chat with us. The principal showed the letter to David's brother and said, I can expel you for this right now, but I'm willing to let it go on one condition. David and Justin were both about to graduate, so the principal gave them an ultimatum. He stated that David and his brother were to not contact me or Justin in any way, shape, or form for the rest of the school year, or he would see to it that neither of them would graduate. I was mad because Justin did nothing wrong, but in the end, we just wanted this whole mess to be over with. From that point on, David didn't bother me again, thankfully, but I'm still filled with anxiety to this day. He made me afraid for my life or even to walk the halls of my school. Justin and I ended up breaking up that semester for unrelated reasons and the following year I didn't have to see either of them ever again. A few years later, however, David tried to send me a friend request on Facebook. I had an immediate panic attack and not only deleted the request, but I blocked him as well. I even unfriended and blocked the two mutual friends we had for good measure. Sure, I was being paranoid, but it made me feel better. There was one last incident involving David, not with me, but with my younger brother. When he was 14, he took his then-girlfriend to see one of the Transformer movies, and David walked in. Upon recognizing my brother, he sat behind him in his date and kept laughing uncontrollably at inappropriate times and even started kicking their seat. My brother tried confronting him, but it did no good. They didn't bother getting the manager because my brother's date was too afraid he would attack them if they tried to leave. Thankfully, that was the last instant I or anyone else close to me ever had with him. I'm doing much better now. I'm 30 years old and ironically I ended up marrying one of the guys who sat with me in the gym that day. My advice to any teenagers reading this is that you should always pay attention to red flags and get rid of toxic people in your life. It's always better to end up alone than stuck with someone who makes you feel bad and treats you like your feelings don't matter. I used to work as a manager of a fast food place in a rather seedy part of a medium sized city. I had worked at the nicer location until they decided to transfer me and there were rumors that the location I ended up getting sent to was going to be shut down, which did end up happening a few years after I finally left. The point is that the place wasn't well taken care of. The dining room was dated and old and the owners were currently not updating or maintaining the place well. They were just barely maintaining the very basic safety requirements and sometimes they weren't at all. For example, I often worked the closing shift, which for this location at the time was 4pm to midnight. Between 7pm and 11pm it was me running the drive through and front counter by myself, and one employee running the kitchen. At 11pm that other employee would go home, and I was left by myself to tidy up and do the deposit between 11pm and midnight. This isn't really safe, and I'm not sure if it was even entirely legal at the time. This was over a decade ago, so who knows. Just to provide a little context and background here, I'm a girl but I'm not what you would consider small, and six foot, and during this time I think people would probably say I came across as more than a little stern. I was younger but I had already spent years working in fast food, getting treated terribly by customers and having drinks and food thrown at me. The location I worked at was a swarm with junkies and drug dealers and just generally scary behavior. All this to say, I didn't get ruffled that easily and I took a lot of things in stride. However, on this night, I was working the night shift with a new guy. The new guy had probably been working there for more than a few weeks. I would worked with him a few times before, but never the closing shift and from the first time I would met him, I would always gotten a strange vibe from him. And again, I'm not someone who, at the time, got ruffled easily. Prior to this, I would worked with a night janitor at the other location who'd had an Adderall addiction and rather unpredictable and scary rage problem and some creepy incel kid who barely spoke more than two words at a time and when he did it it was always something about how much he disliked women and me in particular not an exaggeration 
But this guy, this new dude, he was a whole different level of weird. He had a kid and professed to be a single father. He brought the kid around during the day and the kid and his clothing were always really dirty. Like really dirty and not only that, but the kid also occasionally had bruises on his head and arms. The kid was a toddler and I know that toddlers can get into things, but one look at that kid and I knew that those bruises were not just a little kid messing around. I never saw the new guy behave aggressively towards his kid at all, but I don't know. It was just a feeling. And that feeling translated into other things. I don't know, he was just creepy. It wasn't one thing in particular. It was just a feeling I got when I was around him. He was a medium-height, stocky young guy. He was totally average in every way, but he just had a vibe about him. He was always friendly, never rude or aggressive, but his eyes were just lifeless, for lack of a better descriptor. On this night, I think he might have been called in to cover a shift for someone else. I was in charge of making the schedules most of the time, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have scheduled him to work a closing with me since I found him so off-putting. The first part of the night was fairly normal. I ran the drive through in the front counter, and he ran the kitchen between 8 to 11 p.m. He was talking to me on and off between orders, telling me about his ex and how he'd come to be a single father. Apparently the mother of his child had a drug problem. In hindsight, I think a lot of what he said meant to inspire sympathy. He really laid out the troubled tale of him and his son on thick, but at the time, I just felt a little bad for both of them. Especially his kid, who I suspected was being abused. But despite being seen as stern, and I was definitely still young and naive when it came to manipulative people... He told me that he had moved to the city and immediately had trouble finding work prior to getting the job at the place we worked at. He said he'd been running out of money and was behind on rent, bills, and didn't have any formula for his son. At the time, I think I just empathized with him and said that that sucked. We were both working in fast food, and I thought it was obvious that neither of us had any money. The place was bare bones minimum wage, and I was barely getting by with three roommates and only pretty much eating the free meal I was given from the restaurant every day. Anyway, he laid it on thick at night, but I don't know that I was really paying all that much attention to it. People tended to ramble when working the late shift, and I'd gotten used to listening to people spontaneously talk about their personal problems. I had a habit of just listening and not really reciprocating the sharing, and I guess this didn't really go over very well with the new guy. At some point, the new guy said something to the effect of, You don't talk much, do you? I'm telling you my whole life story here and you got nothing to say? I don't know if it was just that I was coming across as unsympathetic or more likely that he was frustrated that I wasn't successfully manipulating me into giving up personal details about myself. As far as I was concerned, he was just someone I was working with and I didn't know him. I didn't really want him to know me and... Certainly, I wasn't about to start telling him anything that wasn't surface-level chit-chat. But the guy was really intimidating. Something about his tone was off. It definitely wasn't a jokey accusation or off-the-cuff comment. I can't remember exactly what I said, but I remember I just tried to play it off somehow. He didn't say anything more about it, but after the silence between us seemed a little tense. At 11pm, it was time for him to go home. The normal procedure was that the kitchen closer would tidy their area and an actual kitchen cleaner would come in a few hours later to deep clean things. In our case, it was a husband and wife team who did several locations, but they didn't usually come in until a few hours after I left. So this guy was only tasked with basic cleaning and then I would let him out after which I would stay behind to prepare the deposit. But instead of this happening smoothly, this guy goes into the staff bathroom and stays there for a long while, like almost 20 minutes or something. I didn't know what was going on, nor did I know exactly how to handle the situation. It had honestly never happened before. People usually couldn't get out of there fast enough at the end of the night. Was he sick? Did he fall asleep? I didn't know, but I honestly just wanted to get my work done and go home. He finally emerged and quickly walked to the door and left. I was relieved. It was weird, but I just shrugged it off and hurried back to the office to get done with what I needed to get done. Not ten minutes later, I start to hear a banging at the back door of the restaurant. 
loud, repeated banging. Normally, I would ignore this. The back door faced an alley and was right next to a street full of bars and pubs. People leaving the bars and pubs often got the idea that banging on a door would get them after-hours food service because, well, they were drunk. So this wasn't necessarily uncommon. So I just ignored it and kept hurrying to get things done. But the banging did not stop, and it somehow just seemed to get louder and louder and more urgent. So I finally got up and went to look out the peephole to see who was there. At this point, I was definitely on edge, and this edginess swelled into a full-out anxiety attack when I see that it's the new guy standing at the back door. Now, my first thought was to not open the door. I really didn't want to open the door, but I knew that he knew that I was in there. What if he forgot something inside? What if it was his house keys, car keys, or something? I was going to have to leave the building by that same door at some point, so there really seemed to be no escaping him. So, reluctantly, and very stupidly, yes, trust, I know, I opened the door. What I opened the door to was, quite frankly, terrifying to me. He said he left his jacket, or his keys maybe, I can't remember, inside, and I told him to tell me where and I'd go get them. I didn't want him to come inside. If this had been any other person I worked with regularly, this would be no big deal. I'd let him back in let them get whatever they left behind and they'd take off, but I instinctively knew I didn't want this dude back inside, in the dark, empty restaurant with me. But new dude was not having it. He pushed past me and said he'd get him himself. Then he proceeded to shut himself in the bathroom again, and at this point, I just panicked. Instead of staying there by the door, which in hindsight I should have, I rushed back to the office. Stupid girl, that's me had left some of the cash I was counting for the deposit out. Question, what dummy would answer the back door at night at all, and especially with a till out? Well, this girl, I guess. This dumb girl. I managed to stuff the cash in the safe and lock it before it came to find me. The office was dark, it was summer, and the air conditioning was on full blast, but this dude was sweating a lot. I was taller than him, and I'm not a small girl, but... Somehow I just knew that this guy was about to hurt me. He was keyed up. As I watched his eyes dart around the office, I grabbed my jacket hanging on the hook next to me. I hadn't finished my deposit, but I was getting out of there. I didn't care how much stuff I got into in the morning for my work not being done. I smiled and told him that I was just leaving and that he could walk with me. I was really just trying not to show my panic. Whatever he had planned, I wanted to give him an out for him to rethink it. So I smiled, grabbed my purse, and started to move towards the door. New guy, who was standing in the doorway, did not budge though. He started talking though about his son, about the money trouble he'd been having, and capped the whole story off with a request for a loan. From the tone of his voice, it was clear this was not a loan. He was demanding money from me. He said he would pay me back as soon as he got paid and that I'd really be helping him out. I didn't know what to do. He had me trapped. I wasn't leaving the office or the building unless he allowed it. Or at this point at least, I wasn't leaving without a fight. Something told me that despite my height difference, I wasn't going to win. So, I gave him money for my wallet. Fifty dollars, I think. When I gave it to him, he said, Thanks. You... Really helping me out and my son. I won't forget it. And when he said it, he had no expression. No smile. No speech affect at all. He didn't seem grateful or even relieved. Just dead eyes, arms limp at his sides. It was terrifying. To this day, I don't remember how I got him to the door. All I remember was shutting the door behind him, making sure the door was securely locked and rushing into the office to burst into tears. I didn't finish my work, but I stayed in there until I could force myself to leave out of the same door. I was sure he was going to jump me when I left. The thought never occurred to me to call the cops. I don't know why. I guess I just felt like nothing serious had happened yet. He'd asked for money, and I'd willingly given it to him. Despite the fact I felt I had no choice and had been scared out of my mind. I only saw him one more time after that but neither of us ever mentioned that night or the money. I don't know why I didn't ask for it back. I think I was embarrassed or scared or both. I don't know. 
I don't think I've ever told anyone in my life this story, or at least if I have, I definitely left out the part where I gave him money and never got it back. Pretty quickly after that, he stopped showing up to his shifts and I never saw him again. I don't believe in throwing words like psychopath around. I think people overuse psychopath terms like that, making them just synonymous with anyone who's just horribly behaved. And there are a lot of varying degrees of terribly behaved people in the world, unfortunately. But after taking a lot of abnormal psych classes, I can say that there was definitely something about this guy's affect that was just wrong, for lack of a better term. I'd smile, he'd smile. I'd frown, he'd frown. It was almost like talking to someone pantomiming emotions. Maybe I'm just remembering it that way because it was such a terrifying experience for me, but the truth is that I've never been comfortable talking about this event and to this day, when I do think about it, I feel just as uncomfortable as I did the day it happened, more than a decade ago. So this happened almost a year ago now when I still lived in my apartment complex, which was in a nice area but seemed to attract the weirdest people. Basically, I live at home with my mom and younger sister to attend college. The backstory, there was a neighbor in the building across from mine, an older single woman named Susan. When me and my sister first moved in, we'd hang out near her building with a former friend. She's worthy of her own story to be honest and so we developed a rapport with Susan. We'd bring her tea when she was sick and walk her dog. I was next door neighbors with a different woman called Laura. Laura's a woman of two young kids and she and her boyfriend like to sit on their balcony overlooking the parking lot and smoke into the late hours of the night. Well, one day, Laura was doing this at around 2 a.m. Laura texts my mom that there's been an incident. My mom tells me and my sister, we tend to stay up pretty late and we went to our balcony to see what was up. In the parking lot, we see a car that's halfway backed into another parked car, but almost at a side angle. Laura says the person who was in the car ran away as soon as they hit the other car. The car, however, remained, still running too. So we're wondering what that was all about. My mom goes downstairs to the car to check for damage when she sees a figure standing at Susan's building. It was a man we'd never seen before, and... He was just standing there. Turns out the owner of the sideways car freaked out because he saw us looking and claims literally someone stole it and moved it out of the way so they could have my parking spot. The next morning, my mom texts Susan about the incident as the sideways car was kind of blocking hers. She says she knows what happened and has us come outside so she could tell us. She's standing with the man from the parking lot the night before. He introduces himself as Eric and that he's seeing Susan. When we started talking, it turns out he didn't actually know what had happened. He only saw someone running from the car. But that story's irrelevant now. Anyway, we get to talking and apparently Susan had told him about our family and that I'm studying to be a therapist. I confirm and he just lights up. He goes on and on about all the similar work he's done and thanks me for my service, which was odd. He starts giving me names of places I go to for shadowing hours and resources for getting a job. Finally, he tells me to use his name when applying for jobs in the future and he'd get me a job at the psych center he apparently helped found, which I looked up and could not corroborate. He was very insistent that I use his name. Next, he talks to my sister. Susan had told him she likes movies so he told her that he had a small speaking role in one of those teen book-to-film adaptations we used to obsess over. So, of course, when we go home, we look up his name that he gave me along with the movie title. Nowhere is he pictured in the film or given any sort of credit for it. So we dropped the movie title and just looked up his name. It wasn't a movie that we found. Nope. Apparently, he had been infamous in our town for years as someone known as the Child Biter. He had earned the name by biting an eight-year-old girl who was playing with his daughter. A few years later, he bites another girl and apparently stalked her family in a public parking lot after. Another few years pass and he is a third victim. We're freaking out and text Laura, who's kind of a gossip buddy. 
She has two young kids, so she's furious that this guy with actual criminal records was allowed to move in, though he wasn't put on the lease. We were concerned too because a lot of kids live in ours in Susan's building. The question came up of whether to tell Susan. We debated, but decided it was the best thing. My mom covers for me and my sister by saying we looked up his name and movie in front of Laura. Susan demands to know why Laura is concerned. My mom tells her to talk to Laura herself, so she does. She knocks on Laura's door and asks her what her concerns are. Laura barely gets one sentence out about how there are kids everywhere and she's trying to be a good parent before Susan turns around and just leaves, just like that. There are a few families whose kids I babysit who pretty much let their kids wander the complex all day with no supervision. Unless I'm outside, then it's free babysitting apparently. We tell some of them and they're enraged. For two days, there's not a single kid outside. After that, I guess the parents decided actually looking after their kids was too much work and gradually let them play outside again alone. A few days later, an eight-year-old girl we'd babysit and her friend ran up to tell us about a nice guy at the pool who gave them M&Ms. A few minutes later, Eric strolls up with his bathing suit and Maddie tells us it was him. We avoid eye contact, but he slows when he passes us. We warn Maddie and her friend in eight-year-old terms to stay away from him. Another time we're visiting a friend who lives in his building. He emerges right as we enter the hallway. He puts on a huge grin and starts making small talk. We awkwardly excuse ourselves and go to the friend's house. We go inside and our friend keeps looking out the window. There's Eric, standing by his car just staring through the window. Part of our babysitting includes picking up Maddie from the bus randomly in the week when asked. The bus stop is right next to the pool. And who do we see in a lounge chair with sunglasses not doing a thing every single day at bus time? Eric. Now we're all kind of mad at this dude. We contact the property manager who says she can't do anything because he's not registered as living there. If he stays longer than two weeks though, he'll be charged for not being on it. Well, the two weeks ended and then we never saw him again. I'm still stumped as to why he told me to use his name as a reference when a simple search of his name shows all this history. Again, I lived in a nice area in a small suburban town. No idea what it was about those apartments that attracted these weirdos and criminals. Before I moved away for work, I used to be heavily involved in the art scene in my old city, especially small theatrical type gigs. When you run in those circles, you see and interact with the same people a lot. Broadly, this was fine, and that's how I met plenty of my best friends. This is a story about a dude I did four shows with, and God, was he a weird one. Enter Eric. We're both involved in a local production, and our characters share a ton of scenes, so predictably... We spend a lot of time together and get pretty friendly, sending each other memes, venting about annoyances over messenger, typical friend stuff. I'm a touchy-feely person, so the occasional hug when we hadn't seen each other in a while was par for the course. I did the same to all my other friends too, so I didn't think anything weird was about it. The same happened when he started asking me to get coffee before rehearsal. I love caffeine, I love conversation, sounds good to me. Little did I know is that to him, the simple act of getting coffee and hugging now meant we were dating. He hadn't asked me out, hadn't used the word date or boyfriend, girlfriend or anything of that nature. I was definitely not in the room for this decision. He just decided I was his girlfriend. He also began to craft some off-the-wall narrative that we were in love, which he kept texting our mutual friend Max about. When on Halloween he kept telling me how sexy my costume was, I was a little confused. Generally, friends don't talk like that, but I brushed it off. I chalked it up to the fact that it involved a dress and fishnets. Figured it was whatever. Until he randomly kissed me. Because I didn't know the whole girlfriend thing yet, I didn't mind it too much. He was a handsome enough guy, and we were friends. I wasn't opposed to having a fling with him, which is what he acted to me like he wanted. We made out a few times, kept making inside jokes, and it was more or less chill. That was all I signed up for, and I told him as much. Then he starts getting creepy. 
he starts pressuring me to get into his car with him at night to cuddle. Something about him being so focused on wanting me alone at night gives me a weird vibe I can't explain, and I keep declining. I start to wonder if he has the wrong idea, so we get coffee again, and at some point I mention that I can't be his girlfriend. I wish I could say it ended there. He also starts making a big deal about me being the only younger girl than him he's ever wanted. Eric is six months older than me, and we're both in our mid-twenties. Weird then, weird with hindsight. He follows it up by saying he still has a high libido and really wants to bone. Meanwhile, he is still obsessively texting Max about how in love with me he is and thinking we have a deep connection which again, mostly consists of memes and caffeine. All the while, he says none of this to me. When we were in shared spaces like rehearsals and I didn't give him my full attention or drop whatever I was doing and pay attention to him, he'd do increasing dramatic things like start randomly crying or other dramatic nonsense. The next time we try to talk about this, he keeps insisting I played with his heart. I try and insist I had no intention of playing him, that I've told him multiple times we weren't dating and that I'm honestly not sure what I did. It ends in a rant about random things I'd done months ago that he apparently never stopped being annoyed about. He pretty much totally stops talking to me after that, being cordial at rehearsals, which is frankly a relief. When getting coffee with Max near closing night one week, they show me all his dramatic and all his weird confessions of us being in love. I show them my own text history, showing that Eric literally never clued me in about our apparent whirlwind romance. She gives me some pleasant closure by showing me one text about our last weird conversation wherein Eric said my refusal to apologize for not stopping mid-rehearsal to hug him months earlier had made him lose all feelings for me. That's more or less where my weird fantasy not romance with him ends. But I don't feel good knowing that after a bunch of other people including me left the cast party, he apparently hooked up with three 19-year-olds at once. So much for thinking a woman six months your junior was... Too young, huh? This all started when I was probably around the age of nine in the summertime. My brother was a year younger than me, and long story short, he convinced me to go look for some cats that he had seen. I put my shoes on and followed my little brother out the door. We walked the streets in search of these kittens, completely unsupervised. We lived in a small town and my mom worked at a Pizza King until 9pm every weekday. My dad worked until midnight at Johnson Controls. That left our older sister, 13, to supervise, but she was always off doing God knows what. Because of these circumstances, I realized later we were perfect targets. Predictable schedules, lack of supervision and comfortable in our tight-knit Midwestern neighborhood. My brother led me about six blocks away when someone called out to us. I turned my head to find four young men leaning up against an old gray two-door beater. They were standing outside of a known drug house, and they were smoking cigarettes, seemingly minding their own business. The one who called out to us, closest to the passenger seat, asked us, Do you guys want some gum? I stopped dead in my tracks, and... My brother looked confused. They offered us gum. It was eerily reminiscent of our yearly stranger danger assemblies in the school auditorium. My brother and I looked at them for a second, but then turned around and started walking back the way we came, saying nothing. They yelled at us to stop, and we turned our heads and saw the driver getting into his car quickly, and the passenger pulling the seat up to let the other two in the back. As the engine started, we ran. We ran through the yard of a man whose lawn was always way overgrown. We tried to crouch low and lose them, but that loud engine and that old beater was getting closer. It didn't occur to me that they could see the grass moving as we crawled through. We got up this time and ran at full speed, weaving in and out of people's yards to try to buy us some time. They followed. When I realized there was no outrunning a car, we took a straight line to one of our neighbor's houses and started beating on their back door. The car sped out from around the corner and stopped abruptly in the driveway, so we abandoned that idea and jumped over a fence. We eventually made it back to our house and thought we'd lost them. My mom's voice startled me from behind my sister. 
Where have you been? Where's your sister? I think she had come home because she was on delivery route that day. Sometimes when someone messed up a pizza, the owners would let my mom take it home to us if she was on delivery so that we had something to eat when the pantry was empty. I started to tell my mom what had happened, and she didn't look like she was too keen on buying the story until I stopped mid-sentence at the sound of a sputtering engine. I looked outside and the four men drove past our house slowly, looking into our windows, making eye contact, and giving us a menacing look. My mom saw the men, tried to close the blinds, the track was broken but failed, and took us to stay inside for the rest of the day. She left after that. I can't explain why, so don't ask, she just did. Later that night, still no sign of our sister, and we were hungry. We made some mac and cheese and put on Hannah Montana to get our minds off of things. Laughing at scenes that weren't funny, my nerves started to settle a little bit. However, I kept seeing this tiny red light in the corner of my eyes coming from the window. I kept brushing it off. It could have been anything. After some time, I finally stood up and went over to the window to investigate. I saw this red dot was actually the light of a video camera. I gasped at the sight of this, and he ran away immediately towards another man illuminated by a street lamp down the road. Naturally, I panicked and I cried. I ran outside and screamed my sister's name as loud as I could and ran back inside. I called 911 first and then my mom, and told them that there were two men with what I thought was a video camera outside on the street. The police showed up after circling the area and said they'd stake out for a couple of hours at the house on the corner, but that the man would probably be long gone. They never found the man, but the man found us, over and over again. A couple of years later, my brother had the neighbor kid over for a sleepover. We all hung out in his room until late at night, laughing loudly and shooting BB guns at the ceiling and each other. I left the room, and when I came back, my brother told me that a hand had slapped the window and slid down like in a horror film. I thought he was just trying to scare me and I still believe he was probably lying. I was in the middle of telling him he was full of it when I saw that little red dot again, silencing us. We ducked to the floor at first, silent, unbreathing, and then my brother crawled over and turned off the light. We stayed there for a long time until waking our parents up, but they found nothing. I passed it off as a prank. Another couple of years later, in an insomniac-induced all-nighter, I was sitting in our sunroom, with big windows all around and no curtains except for one to my right, reading a book. It was about three in the morning and the whole house was asleep. I had my headphones in, listening to my MP3 player when I thought I heard a loud noise over the music. I looked up, startled, and saw a man at the door, watching me. At three in the morning, this is the closest I had ever been to him. I froze and stared at him. He was about six feet tall, and his hair was long and wavy over his eyebrows. It kind of looked like bangs or a comb over without enough gel. He was wearing a white hoodie and long blue pants that nearly covered his shoes. He looked like an aged version of the guy who offered us a piece of gum years before, and he had a blue digital camera in his hand down to his side. He walked away casually without fear or haste, maintaining eye contact, and I followed him with my eyes past the windows and behind the only window that was concealed with blinds out of my line of sight. I ran inside and told no one. I passed it off as a sleep-deprived hallucination for months, denying the nightmares and the cold chills before I finally came to the realization that this was the man I had seen years before, and I remembered something that door's lock was broken. Those weren't the only times we caught someone outside of our windows. It happened for years, and it became an odd fact of life, but he seemed to be less interested the older I grew. It's strange because he always purposely reveals his presence instead of trying to stay discreet, and even showed his face to me that one night. It makes me wonder what kind of pictures and videos he captured and how long he would watch before making himself known to us. I used to convince myself that these were several unrelated instances because it scared me more to think that one person had the capacity to invest that much into us. It seemed like an odd revenge for outrunning him years before. Hey friends, thanks for listening. 
be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord, interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.